Our next session is a quick Q&A discussion with Karen Bach, who's an occupational therapist and worked closely with the GNA01 research clinic that we facilitated uh, Thursday and Friday here at, at WashU. She's a pediatric and adult occupational therapist and specializes in comprehensive interventions for tick disorders, Tourette syndrome, functional movement disorders as well. So Karen, with that, we'll turn to you. And uh, as we get to the Q&A, we'll run some microphones around so that we can hear uh, on the webinar side as well. Hi, everyone. First, I want to say a great big thank you from the research team. We really, really, really appreciated everyone who did participate this year, as well as the previous years. Um, as some of you guys already know, you know, I talked to a lot of you guys um, during our personalized OT assessments. Occupational therapy assessments are just really, really, really challenging. Um, and we found that the first year, we actually decided to revise the assessment tool. And most of you had heard this from me. I really decided that we would look far and wide to find a one that would fit best for our group. And it was a big, huge failure. <laughs> and I will tell you, I put a lot of time in that one <laughs> to find out it was failure. Um, so this year, some of you had the um, had helped me test run our first personalized assessment for what I will now consider a GNA01 or a movement disorder. We haven't decided which way we're going to label it, but a movement disorder occupational therapy assessment tool. What I wanted to explain was that the reason why that is so difficult for OT to be able to find an assessment tool is partly because of the way that those assessment tools were in the past. So the ones that we have out on the market right now are mostly set up to be developmental milestones that progress upward. And our GNA01 group is so unique because a lot of times what I found within that first year was that your children don't develop at the normal pace and they master skills that might, they might master one skill and then skip a bunch of skills and then master another great skill. And so I felt like it was amazing to see that in that trend, but it makes those developmental milestone type assessments tools impossible. And that's why we all felt like it was such a big, huge, difficult process the first year. So what we're doing this year is trying to create a better assessment tool so that it doesn't feel like it's such a difficult process to assess our children and to show progress with our children. Occupational therapy from a standpoint has a lot of benefits and a lot of you do see those benefits. You see them, the benefits through school, you see the benefits through home, and there's a lot of different ways to progress our children. I am not gonna go into a slide presentation like I've done in the last two years. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to personalize answer, personalize questions because I only have 15 minutes today to talk to you guys about your own issues that you're having within day-to-day -day tasks, whether it be self-care, writing issues, eating issues, dressing issues, and to help problem solve different things that we can do to make the kids be as functional and as a bit and have the most independence within day-to-day -day tasks. So what I'm gonna do in a second is I'm gonna have two people running mics and I'm gonna ask if you guys have any specific questions in regards to those types of topics. And I'm going to try and do my best to give you guys some of my own personal experience. Okay, so are we ready runners? All right, does anyone have, wanna start the questions for occupational therapy? Anybody have any questions? Do you want me to stand up too? Or? Okay. I'm going to take it. I'm, the, I'm going to sit. I've been running around with kids. <laughs> um, if I'm too loud, I'm sorry. I'm loud by nature. Um, one of the things that I've been working with Cal uh -huh. and our uh, technology coordinator at school is to help him play video games, like a Nintendo kind of thing. We've been using to low effect an Xbox adaptive controller. Um, what we did find that kind of worked is uh, like a, they're called arcade fight sticks. It's like a bit like an old arcade yep, game with I a know joystick. What you're about. Yeah, uh -huh. 
yeah, we have that. I was able to take it apart, take the ball off the joystick because if you've played arcade games, you know, the slippery ball on the top of the joystick is not maybe the best for our kids. Yep. Um, I put a squig on there. A swig? What is a, a squig? squig? Uh, silicone toys. They're like suction cup oh, toys for kids. Yeah. Okay. It, it works, but it's really a mod thing. So I, I put a nut inside it to screw it on. It's really, you know, trying not to destroy myself in the process doing it. I was wondering, is there a specific joystick mount of some kind that would be better, like a like almost like a cross beam or something like a grip oh, for our kids or something like question. that? I would say, I mean, knowing knowing your own child, I think it would be interesting to look at trying to potentially maybe modify the actual joystick instead, because I think the joystick is the best one that I can think of. I do know one person who I am not an expert within video games. I will never pretend to be. <laughs> Some of you have saw me earlier trying to manipulate video games. I'm not the best at that. I do have an expert. So if you, I will, I'm going to put my email address up, email me that question. I'm going to connect you with an expert that I know that is, does this all the time. Does that make sense? Um, one of the experts that I know um, is from Maryville University and she worked at WashU for a time frame, and she actually spent multiple hours, if not multiple years, working with kids who have movement disorders and other types of disorders to be able to play video games. <laughs> so I actually have a perfect resource for you and I don't have the answer right this minute, but I can give you that answer via, via um, thing. So my best answer to that would be to like to take the, what I would do is take a class, you know, take something that you can actually attach like plastic. And if you work with your OT, they might even be able to do the heat gun if they have a splinting room and they could attach a plastic element so they can make it more of a T-bar. Yeah, we'll use, we'll use mm -hmm. I would actually do, have them actually use splinting material would be what I would do. Put splinting material, if I was, if I had to do this myself and splint and put the splinting material attached to the actual joystick so that they have, he can put his whole hand on there and actually grab it more in a T position. And then if you feel like that's still not giving them enough grasp, you know, remember I showed you guys the Dyson, whoever was at the assessment tool, Dyson would be my next thing. I would go into putting something that is, you know, allows the hand not to slip off as easy. If that doesn't work or it doesn't feel as good, you can also add straps that would help. And I usually say, don't put the strap too heavy, you know, make it loose enough where they can slide it in and out, but it just gives them that extra support so that the hand doesn't slide out as quickly when they're, when they do have their motions. Thanks. Yeah, but I, email me later and I will hook you up with her. Yeah. Uh, James also is very interested in learning about this. So I don't know if there's a group email or I don't know if Sam, I see Samuel over there. So maybe he's also, video games are a big part. Video games uh, is a big one. And I, like I said, this was, that was part of the reason why the woman that I'm talking about created this, started to work on this because this was something that we found with a lot of different um, groups that have similar issues to our GNA01 okay. was having issues adapting. They, in St. Louis, I know they actually, you know, run clubs at times where they actually work with the Apple store to actually make the, to make these adaptions. So it's kind of, so if you hook me, if you get on that email chain with me, I will make sure you both are hooked up with this woman and she will definitely point you in the right direction on how to adapt that video game because she's an expert on that. Anything else? Any other questions? Diaper changes in public? The, Diaper okay. changes. That is definitely a, a huge, huge challenge because we don't always have Diaper changes, it depends on the size of the child and you know what you can do. So obviously most of our kids, as they get older, they're not gonna be able to do diaper changes within on those um, changing tables. Does that make sense? What I usually recommend is thinking, and this is something I talk to parents a lot about as they progress getting older, is looking, is talking to your therapy teams in regards to other types of modes of ways of handling this. This can be simple as some of my kids who, as they get older and they're 
you know, maybe in their 10 years of age or older, and they can't be lifted onto a table any longer, we look at different modes of ways of managing bowel and bladder. So one of them is looking at external catheters that can be used just for a day use versus using a diaper. Does that make sense? So instead of having a diaper on. Bowel movements are a little bit more challenging. And that's where I would say, as an OT, what we usually talk about is structuring timeframes to try and figure out the routine to figure out when BMs are being happening, because you can't always do that easily on a toilet. And kid, our kids are not easy to transfer on and off you know, a toilet. So it's obviously laying them down is not gonna be. So I talk about structuring the day to have understanding of when different things is. And if, if they're not on a structured time frame of going to the BM, we can, you can work with the occupational therapists that you have to help create that so that you actually know times of the day that that is actually going to happen. So you don't plan activities during that time so that you can make sure that you're in an environment that is going to be okay to you. Does that make sense? I wish there was an easy solution to that. Um, some of our kids, when we do that, you know, it, it requires two people to be in a bathroom stall to, to, to take off that diaper. And it's just impossible to do that. I, I wish I could say like that there was a simple solution to that. That isn't, um, but talk to their teams. Cause I do find that like my, you know, if I was talking to a cerebral palsy group before a lot of my cerebral palsy clients that are going into high school, college work environments, that's what they're doing. They're using what we call um, an external catheter. Um, so it's not one that you, if you're familiar with catheters, it's not one that inserts into them. It's one that actually, they have a couple different versions that you can use that is, um, that can be used just for daytime use. Can, does that make sense? And they can wear a leg bag at that time, just for the time frame, And then it can be removed when they get home that they don't have to have it on. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, hold on a second. We'll get you a mic. Hello. Um, so my daughter Emery um, originally had occupational therapy. Uh, we live in Florida, and um, we tried it for a little while. And uh, what you said in the very beginning about how our kids work on a different timetable than every Absolutely. other child. Um, we've seen that a lot in her physical therapy. It's kind of at the same level, same level, same level, boom, she'll like learn a new skill and it's wow. And it's an amazing, but then we're at there for a long, long, long time. Um, and her physical therapist has been great being patient with that. Um, but with occupational therapy, we had to stop doing occupational because she wasn't progressing. I guess they were saying, yes. because without that, they have no way to justify it through insurance. insurance. Yes, <laughs> exactly. The, the big insurance. Um, <laughs> so we had to regress from that. Um, thankfully when we uh, get home, we're going to be reevaluating and seeing if we can get her back in that. Um, but as far as just wondering if there was any type of resources or something we can point any physical therapist or occupational therapist to when they give us the, well, your kid's not progressing, so we can't justify it through insurance anymore. You know, where we can say, Hey, this is how our kids are. You know, we need to give them more there, time. Unfortunately, at this point, and that's what we're working on within the GNA01 research that we're doing here at WashU is to show that the developmental aspects of how these kids do develop at a different rate. So within the next few years, we'll have a lot more research out there. But for the time being, if an occupational therapist gives you a hard time with that, you have I will be giving you my email. Send them, send them my email. <laughs> I'm going to show them the video of this right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I will talk to them and explain what I know. Yeah. Because we make can sense? say it, but if, you yeah. know. The, the problem within our group is, is that they just don't have the understanding of the disorder. And I'm going to tell you as an OT, I spent quite a bit of time in the last, you know, year looking at different things, you know, interventions for OT. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot out there on the research track. So yeah. if they're even like me, a good a good therapist, like if you're a good therapist and you don't know something, you go to look for data for that. Yeah. There's nothing there. Yeah, absolutely. And Does it's not to say even that like the therapist doesn't want to work with your kids, but their hands are tied they just, because they have requirements to insurance. They got to show something. Yeah. And they're know? not as blessed as I am yeah. to have met all of you. <laughs> does that make sense? And to see that GNA01 does vary from one side of the spectrum to the other. And 
that we do have to personalize the way we treat our kids to be able to get them. So I think what you're talking about, and this is pretty common within outpatient, and I do work in outpatient, so I can kind of explain that process a little bit to you guys. And I only have a couple minutes left because I'm at my end of my 15 minute timer. <laughs> um, occupational therapy with insurance does have to justify um, progress. However, if they're a good occupational therapist, they should be doing what we call episodic care. Episodic care means that your child should be able to be reevaluated even within a six month period if they need it. Does that make sense? So you can do a short period of therapy, maybe during the summer, another short period of therapy during a winter session, and then another short per period of therapy. And the goal of those short periods of therapy should be for you as a parent to learn new skills to progress. So like some of you who have met in my sessions, each of you who met with me, a lot of you came out with a new idea, a new thing that you can do. That's what I call episodic, meaning you saw me that one time and I gave you a new idea to try with your child. That idea should be something you could try for a few weeks and then move back and come back to me. I would, some of my kids I, that are in this room, I wouldn't say do once a week therapy if you saw me. I'd want to see you maybe every couple of weeks so you could work on a new skill and then come back, tell me how that worked and I'll adapt that skill. And then if that doesn't work, we'll adapt it again in a couple of weeks. Weekly therapy is not necessary for our kids who have lifelong conditions. We call it episodic care for outpatient, and it should be episodic for somebody who has a lifelong disorder. You're going to need therapy for a long time. Your kids should not be stuck in a therapy room every single week with us. We want them to get them to be participatory within their day as an occupational therapist. Our goal is to facilitate that. So we're going to be coaches for you. So, and I can explain that to any OT that sends me an email. Yeah. I'm, I absolutely don't mind doing that. Thank you. I, if you guys have any other questions, you're welcome to catch me. I'll be here for about maybe another half an hour to an hour. Um, and you're welcome to catch me at any point. And you have my email up here. Feel free to take a picture and send me an email if you have any questions. Um, and I really would appreciate any feedback for anybody who did the OT assessment on things that we feel could be, that, that you feel, I'm sorry, that you feel could be better because that OT assessment tool is something that we are personalizing for your group. So if it's something that you feel like, hey, we didn't capture in that, tell me about it because I wanna be able to fix it and make it better, okay? Thank you guys. Thank you, Karen. So our next speakers, Hardly need an introduction, especially in this room, but we'll give him one nonetheless. Samuel Habib and his dad, Dan, are experienced filmmakers and recently had their documentary about breaking down barriers featured by the New York Times. They're going to show us an edited version of their film during this morning's keynote address that helps make it a little more appropriate for a wide audience. And they're also going to share their experiences and learnings with us more broadly. Dan Habib works as a director, producer, cinematographer of nationally distributed documentaries, four of them in total, as well as many short disability related films. His films have been featured in dozens of film festivals translated into 17 languages and used worldwide to support inclusive education efforts and disability rights. From 2014 to 2017, Dan served on President Obama's Committee for People with Intellectual Disabilities, and he's delivered a widely viewed TEDx talk titled Disabling Segregation on the Benefits of Inclusion to Students with and Without Disabilities. Samuel Habib is a filmmaker and a community college student midway towards his associate degree in liberal arts. In 2016, he made a film about disability rights, leader Judith Human, and that was featured in Breaking Down Barriers Film Festival in Moscow. His viral short experience turned into a, film, a viral short film on his encounter with then president, or candidate, presidential candidate Joe Biden was featured in Forbes magazine and other publications. Samuel has been a Concord Monitor newspaper columnist and has presented nationally on disability rights, inclusive education, and his educational and societal transition to adulthood. Samuel and Dan, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks for being here with us. Hello, everybody. I'm Samuel Habib. I'd like to tell you about my inclusive life and about my transition planning and advocacy work. 
I use a communication device to communicate. I can also talk, but it takes a lot of effort and sometimes it is hard for people to understand me. I've been in regular school and classes since preschool. I am 22 years old. I've kept most of my friends from middle school and made some new friends. I was pretty nervous about going to high school but it was awesome. One day a girl at school that I like asked me to eat lunch with her. I got so excited that I kicked my feet out and broke the foot plate right off of my chair. My favorite class in high school was street law. My teacher was Mr. Boseman. He was funny. The class was really interesting. We got a tour of a police station, a county jail, and had a mock trial in an actual district courtroom. A lot of the time I worked on class assignments with my friends either in person or on Google Docs. I always have my Toby device for social and academic communication. The teachers for each of my classes give us a list of key vocabulary for each unit ahead of time for my Toby communication device. That way I can use the words for homework, tests, and contributing to class discussions. When I was still in high school, I was part of the school TV station called CHS Life. I did the Red Sox and New England Patriots report each week. I was also on the yearbook staff and the school newspaper. I took photos on my iPhone and did interviews. I was a member of the Be The Change Club. We organized multicultural events at the school and welcomed new Americans who moved to Concord. Since freshman year I helped lead our team check-in meetings with a PowerPoint. Here is an example of the PowerPoint that I would make in advance with my special education coordinator. Each of my teachers would talk about what is going well and what could be improved. I played unified soccer, basketball, and track. Unified sports teams are made up of students with and without disabilities competing against other schools with unified sports teams. I graduated from Concord High School with a regular high school diploma. I am in my fourth year of college at New Hampshire Technical Institute, which is the local community college. I have been taking one college class a semester. So far I have taken seven classes. Mindful communication, psychology, contemporary ethical issues, cultural anthropology, sociology, U.S. history, and social media strategies. My favorite class so far was mindful communication. We learned about meditation, how to be present in the moment, and the importance of listening when communicating. I am about halfway towards an associate's degree in liberal arts. I am proud of what I've accomplished in school so far. I am thinking about transferring to the University of New Hampshire in the future. This is my recently retired service dog Proton. Proton hangs out with me outside of school. Before he retired he came to doctor appointments and on vacations with us. And when we are out in public he's a great wingman. Proton died of cancer at home in March of 2022. We had him for nine years, and we had a great life together. I miss him. I have a lot of hobbies and passions. I sometimes ski in the winter and kayak in the summer. I'm a huge NASCAR fan. At one race at the New Hampshire Motor Speedway I met my favorite driver, Kevin Harvick. I love to travel and fly on planes. My dad and I went to see a race at the Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama. 
My family and I went to Prescott, Arizona to visit my brother at college a couple of times, and we saw the Grand Canyon. A few years ago we went to a game at the big house at the University of Michigan. My dad went there for college and I want to go back for another game. I went to the Double H Ranch Sleepaway Camp for seven years. I went to the alumni camp two summers ago. It's in the Adirondacks in New York. We do a ton of fun stuff like swimming, archery, a talent show, go to an amusement park, and a zip line. There were a lot of Yankee fans there so I had to represent Red Sox Nation. I love listening to music. I've seen Imagine Dragons, The Avett Brothers, Macklemore, Train and Modest Yahoo in concert. I also want to see Coldplay, Mumford and Sons, Hozier, and Aloe Black. Right now my career plan is to be a documentary filmmaker. One summer I had an internship at Concord Community TV. I learned about film editing and talked to campers about the films I've made. I also completed a year-long leadership program through the Institute on Disability at UNH. It helped me become a better advocate. In the summer of 2020, I did an internship with the Concord Monitor newspaper with support from Voc Rehab. I pitched an idea to interview people with sports jobs and see how the COVID virus and the racial justice movement was affecting their jobs. It was awesome to hear how all of their jobs have been impacted in these uncertain times. I also did video interviews with all eight major candidates in New Hampshire about disability rights issues, including voting rights, funding for adult disability services, special education, health care, housing, and employment. The interviews are on YouTube. I have GNAO1 Neurodevelopmental Disorder. I found this diagnosis in March 2019 through genetic testing. GNAO1 is a genetic disorder caused by a mutation in a protein coding gene. It caused my CP and other health challenges. Only about 300 people in the world have been diagnosed with GNAO1. But I really don't mind having cerebral palsy. I just wish I didn't have so many doctor's appointments and that the world was totally wheelchair accessible, especially my friends' homes. That's why I've advocated for more accessibility at my high school. I couldn't sit with my friends in the bleachers at the basketball games. I sent an email to the principal and athletic director. In the email I said I want to report a problem. I can't get up into the student section of the stands at basketball or football games. I hope you can fix the problem by bringing the student section down to the court and closer to the field. Thanks, Samuel Habib. At the basketball games they moved the student section down so I could sit with my friends. but the city owns the football field and there is not much space for wheelchairs when I'm in the stands. I blocked the aisle so I still can't sit with my friends. So I testified at the city council meeting and asked them to rebuild the football bleachers. I won't give up until the football stands are really wheelchair accessible. The positive thing about having a disability is that I have an awesome team every day. I also like being part of the disability community. Now, we are really looking forward to showing you the film I'm directing with my dad. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our project first. Since January 2020 I've been interviewing some awesome adults with disabilities about relationships, work, education, living on their own, healthcare, finding support people, and every part of transitioning to adulthood. 
I am also filming my own life from my perspective with two GoPro cameras mounted on my wheelchair. And my dad is filming and photographing my life. Before COVID, we were traveling to do interviews and filming. This past year we were doing the interviews remotely. Now we are fully vaccinated and took a trip to Indianapolis in October and traveled to New York City in November to film. We are looking forward to planning more trips in the near future. We are really excited to talk about it afterwards. Logo for the New York Times. OpDocs. The New York Times OpDocs presents My Disability Roadmap. Dan Habib and Samuel Habib. Unified Sports Basketball Game 2017. My name is Samuel Habib. He takes to the court. I live in Concord, New Hampshire. Samuel passes the ball. I've been in regular school and classes since preschool. Teams line up for post-game high fives. In my senior year of high school, I asked my friend Anita to go to the prom with me. She said yes. And then I had a seizure. Damn. Samuel and Anita in prom attire. But we did go to the prom together and we had an awesome time. Enthusiastic campers on stage. I like hanging out with my friends. And going on adventures. Yes, sir. On a zip line van a roller coaster. And I'm a speed freak. Down a snowy hill in a sit ski, his partner standing behind him. I am in my third year at the local community college. I really want to start dating. I set up a profile on Bumble and Hinge. It's really hard to meet new people when I can't drive in my friends' cars or get into their houses. Out for a stroll. Someday, I want to get married and maybe have kids. But I need to figure out how to do all the things I want to do. Organize stacks of medical supplies getting packed into boxes. Nobody in my family has a disability. My close friends don't have disabilities. Dan helps Samuel dress in a hotel bathroom. They don't understand what it's like to have a disability. Film plays in fast forward, getting ready for the day. I don't want to rely on my mom and dad so much. What about the airport? Dan Habib. TSA agent hands bottles of medications to Dan. Samuel gazes out the plane window. Then he steers into an accessible taxi. I want to figure out how to follow my dreams. Driving past the Washington Monument. But nobody tells you how to be an adult let alone an adult with a disability. The day is cold and sunny. His communication device and the GoPro topple. That's not good. There are badass people with disabilities who figured it out. I want to talk to them. I can learn from them. Maybe they could be my mentors. Heading into an Art Deco apartment building. Hello. Oh my gosh. Long awaited. Samuel, I can't believe it. I am so psyched to finally meet you in person. It's so nice to finally see you. Oh my God. Judy Human is one of the greatest disability rights advocates of all time. She's spent decades fighting for civil rights for disabled people. She's a revolutionary. Looking up from his device, Samuel grins. I am currently working with my dad on a new film project. I'm asking each person about relationships, work, education, and every part of living a full life with a disability. Dan straightens Samuel's head. Samuel taps his device screen with his finger. What did the teachers and principals expect of you during your school years? And what did they expect you would do as an adult? I don't really recall people seriously asking me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I mean, honestly, I don't think I ever really felt comfortable and confident in any of my classes. I could get involved in debates and things of that nature, but that kind of inner sense of confidence and not being afraid, I, I don't think I really ever felt that. Home videos of young Samuel. You're a little different than me because when you were born, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504 was more than 25 years old, but I was born in 47, and there were no laws in place. Your parents 
could talk to lawyers or advocates. None of that existed. What we've been discussing, Samuel, in part is allowing disabled people to feel proud about who we are and to feel like we have a right not to be discriminated against. As a young child, he used a manual wheelchair. Now the FDR Memorial statue where Roosevelt's wheelchair is fully visible. I have cerebral palsy. That means my brain communicates with my muscles differently than most people. The original FDR statue, a large cape hiding his wheelchair. The only thing I dislike about having a disability is all of the medical stuff and my uncontrollable movements. I call the uncontrollable movements the wiggles. They suck and make me really tired. In his Red Sox World Series hoodie. I also have a hard time controlling the volume of my voice. Samuel and Dan side by side. All right, so for Bob Williams, what do you want to ask, Bob? Uh, what did? Samuel's mouth shapes the words before he speaks, his eyes half closed with focus. I your parents, your parents think that about your future when, when they found when they found out that Beautiful. CP. Great. When do you want to ask that question of Bob? First. First. Okay. Breaks out into a huge smile. Can we program it in your Toby. Incredible. So so bright. I love it. A film crew ready to record. What did your parents think about your future when they realized you had cerebral palsy? Bob Williams, disability rights policy leader, helped gain the passage of the ADA. Bob's head lowered. He looks through glasses to type on his wheelchair-mounted communication device with stiff fingers. Like many of their generation, when I was born, my parents were told to institutionalize me and to never look back. Instead, they raised me in the same rough and tumble world of love as my brothers and sisters. When I grew up, the chances were slim to none for a kid like me with cerebral palsy who drooled and had little to no understandable speech ever entering a public school, let alone graduating from high school and college, having a career, getting married, or having a family. Younger Betsy sleds with Samuel in front in a toboggan with back support. His older brother sliding behind them. Holding toddler Samuel in their yard, Dan lowers the boy to kick a soccer ball. I have an older brother named Isaiah. He is 24 and lives in Flagstaff, Arizona. Whoa. Photos, the boys snuggle and cuddle. I didn't see him for over a year because of COVID, and I really missed him. On a FaceTime call. Did I have sex? <laughs> Hell yeah. Samuel smiles. Isaiah smirks playfully. <laughs> Tell you about it? Oh my god. I can't get into detail like that. I love my brother, but he doesn't have a disability. I want to talk about sex and relationships with Keith Jones. Caitlin Ramsey, direct support professional, and Samuel weave through traffic. He has been a mentor for me since I was in elementary school. He tells it like it is. Who the hell is that grown-ass man in the wheelchair? <laughs> Look at you grown up. <laughs> <laughs> 
They fist bump. A hand lowers sunglasses over Samuel's eyes. In medical masks, they ride the elevator to a spacious room at the JCC New York to interview Keith, Crip Hop founder and human rights activist. Samuel smiles gleefully as his finger swipes the selection. Do you have advice for me about sex? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> there are many, many, many ways to, to negotiate the path to getting in intimate situations. But sex, where it has meaning, where it's not just a physical act, where it's emotional, intimate, and it's the full connection with the spirit and the body, that's rare. That comes with somebody who understands who Sam is, knows what makes him laugh, knows what makes him cry, and wants to be there for him the whole time. After seeing Keith, I went to talk with May Soon Zaid. She's hilarious. She uses comedy to take down ableist culture. Thanks for getting together, May Soon. It's awesome to be able to talk to you in person. I hope you don't disappoint me. <laughs> I'm trying to learn more about relationships and sexuality. <laughs> I want to start dating, but it's hard to take that first step. How and when did you start dating? <laughs> so like I said, Muslims don't date, we get married. Um, <laughs> I think relationships are super overhyped. So much, so much work. And that like, even sex, is so overhyped. My advice for relationships is honesty and being realistic. If someone doesn't want to date you because you're disabled, that's not the person that you ever want to date, ever. What is the one piece of advice you'd want to tell every young adult who experiences disability about transitioning to adulthood? The one piece of advice I can give people is you're not alone, find your community. He beams. Samuel and family dance in the yard, run on the beach with a service dog, Proton. My extended family is fun. They accept me as a person. They include me. They understand me. They have high expectations for me. That's why it's so frustrating to meet people who just don't get it. At the airport, someone skitters awkwardly out of Samuel's way. Samuel's doing documentary film work. And... You are such a cutie. Oh. How do you get so cute? <laughs> huh? His smile vanishes. Can you say answer? I'm just like, I'm kind of talking to him like it's a five-year-old, but he's a 20-year-old college student. OK. You're... So, 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 I, so I, I just... how old are you now? <laughs> so just, you know, you can talk to him like you would any other 20-year-old college you? student. <laughs> are you 20? He gazes up to her, then sighs, eyes wandering. You don't know me. My name's Joe. And I've been talking with your dad. Yeah. So Samuel shuts down a little bit when he feels like he's being I'm talked sure. down to. And I feel like you're just talking down to him. I a don't mean to. Yeah. You're like, just, he's a 20 year old college student. And I don't. Where do you go to? Are you in school now, hey? No. All right. We're going to line up to go get first on the plane. Hey. Have a good have trip, flight. Trip. All right. Thanks, you too. Hook, watch yourself. I don't want to run anybody over. Samuel's face, furious and stony, locked in a grimace. Yeah. Yeah. What are you feeling? Uh, uh, oh. 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 What are you feeling? I do. Oh. Oh. Pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Dan tenderly grips his son's shoulder, Samuel's t-shirt. Without communication, there is no freedom. They head down the jetway. Disabled people like me are isolated and excluded from so many aspects of life. But when people talk down to me, they underestimate me. On the plane, Dan prepares medicine for Samuel's feeding tube. Samuel watches the landscape unfold below. Touchdown on a cloudy day. They join Andrew Peterson, marathon runner and fetal alcohol syndrome activist, smiling at a picnic table in a tree-filled park. Samuel taps pictures on his device that accompany pre program statements. I have difficulty talking, and sometimes people talk down to me. Do you feel underestimated because of the way you talk? Never. I ignore anyone who refuses to accept me. It's not easy. 
Instead, I always believed in me. Were your classmates ever mean to you in school? Some laughed and called me names. Far more walked by me like I didn't exist. Samuel's face still and pensive, then he crosses a wide busy street. There is an idea I like called the dignity of risk. Taking risks makes me feel proud, powerful, confident, bold. I need to take risks so I can live an adventurous and full life. One risk I want to take is moving away from home someday. I met someone who took that chance when she was about my age. A Zoom call. Hi, Ali. I'm Samuel. It's awesome to meet you. Hey, Samuel. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for your time today. I've of got course. a bunch of questions to ask you about your transition to adulthood and your career. What is the biggest risk you've taken in your life? Probably when I moved to New York City and I went to NYU because I really was stepping out of the bubble that I grew up in and the safety net that I had. And I sort of was taking on the world on my own. Of course, I had tons of support, but I was really more exposed and more vulnerable. And so I was young and I was 18 and I didn't really even know better. So there was no other option. I was just like, I'm just going to do this. So I did. Ali Stroker, Broadway and TV actor. When I was 19, I also took a big risk. I decided to do deep brain stimulation surgery. All right, so we want to say goodbye here. Right. I hoped it would get rid of the That's wiggles. Would be awesome. Nurses roll his gurney through the corridor. Samuel is asleep after surgery. A handwritten note on his chest. Please be careful around my IV. It has been pulled out before, and I'm anxious it'll happen again. The surgery took about nine hours, and then I was in the hospital for two days. Samuel sleeping, his service dog kissing Betsy. A wide strip of his hair shaved off. They turned on the electrical current a couple of weeks after surgery. In his standing wheelchair, Samuel is still. It feels really good. My body is calm and the wiggles are mostly gone. I had to get back in the bag They tried to deny me, they wouldn't believe it I told them it's happening facts I was grinding all along, never front it's still in the back Deep the brain bag. stimulation has changed my life Getting a Red Sox tattoo Before the surgery, when I got excited Like when watching sports My body would get really wiggly Sometimes, I would have to stop watching Now, my body is calm Shows off his tattoo to Red Sox players, signing autographs for him. Meeting all of these mentors has made me even more proud of who I am, and proud to be part of the disability community. Disability is part of the natural diversity of the world. Shopping at the farmer's market with Dan. We should not be segregated. You don't want to be rolled over by this chair, it's gonna hurt. What motivates you to be a disability rights advocate? Lydia X. Z. Brown. Every single one of us has a moral responsibility to challenge injustice and violence, oppression in every way possible. We can't wait for or rely upon non-disabled people to save us. What motivates me is the knowledge that there is still injustice and oppression, and I cannot rest until I end for it. Social justice. The MLK Memorial in D.C., then at four primary election rallies. I'm learning to become a better advocate. I know I need to be persistent and work hard. I get tired, but I won't give up. Hi, Senator Warren. I'm a college student and I live in Concord. I want to work and earn money, and I get social security. So if I earn money from work, my social security will go down. Please tell me about your plan for this. So check out my disability plan, which was written by the disability community. How will you support more affordable housing for people with disabilities? For everything from long-term care to uh, disability oh, support. I love that question. Thank you. Hi, Vice President Biden. 
How will you support more inclusive education for students with disabilities? You should be integrated into all of the classes because you're smart. <laughs> you're smart, you're smart. The disability is not, does not define who you are. It do doesn't define who you are. I can't believe he stroked my face. Weird. An article from The Mighty on Samuel's thoughts on the interaction. The video of me with Vice President Biden went viral. Biden under fire for stroking a disabled man's face. But I voted for him and I hope he is a strong supporter of disability rights and inclusive education. Pushes his ballot into the machine. We have to tell our own story. May soon. Because when non-disabled people tell our stories, we only get to have three stories. Help me, I'm disabled, cure me, or kill me. And when you have more disabled people behind the camera, writing, shooting, editing, directing, creating docs like you are, telling our own stories, then it won't be the endless pity party. Samuel raises his fist high over Zoom. May soon does the same. Now, Little Island NYC, a new fully accessible park. Samuel and Caitlin pass a spinning optical illusion by the curvy paved path. I face new challenges with my disability all the time. My muscles don't work as well as they used to, so it's gotten more difficult for me to use my communication device or drive my chair independently. Do you want to stare into that? <laughs> but I do not need anyone to feel sorry for me. Excuse us. No. no. <laughs> I can't blame you. I have a good life. I love to travel. I have friends and family and support people that are fun to hang out with. The sun hangs low near the Manhattan skyline. Someone dances on a grid of tiles. Samuel rolls across the tiles, breaks out into a huge smile, and circles back to go again. The sky is pink and orange as they leave the park. Meeting all of these mentors has been empowering. I am part of a strong disability community. We want change and we are going to fight for respect and rights at every opportunity. In medical masks, they join others at a railing to watch the setting sun. People pave the way for me. I want to pave the way for others. Now, I just need to find a girlfriend. Fade to black. Abbreviated credits directed by Dan Habib and Samuel Habib. Producer Dan Habib. Co-executive producer Sarah Boulder and James Lebrecht. Consulting producer Andrea Levant. Editor James Rudenbeck. Composer Max Avery Lichtenstein. Additional music Feso de Madwan Te Uno. Color correction and sound mix Pinehurst Pictures and Sound Rick Degree. Advisory Board, Elijah Armstrong, Alexander Freeman, Taylor Freeman, Tia Holmes, Anna Laundry, Galen Spagler. Audio Description by Social Audio Description Collective. Writer, Cheryl Green. Script Editor, Robert Kinyet. Narrator, Nefertiti Matos Olivares. Thank you. Mitsubishi Electric America Foundation. Westchester Institute for Human Development. Kansas University Beach Center on Disability. Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities. Mazelski Family. Millersville University, UMass Boston Institute for Community Inclusion, University of Rochester Strong Center for Developmental Disabilities, University of South Carolina Center for Disability Resources, Left Moving Image Fund, Association of Washington School Principals, Washington Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, Senior Commissioning Producer Christine Ketcher, Supervising Editor Andrew Blackwell, Series Producer Yvonne Ashley Kuajo, Executive Producer Adam Ellick, Co-Executive Producer Lindsay Krauss, this short documentary is part of a series by independent filmmakers supported by CMP. Executive producers Steve Cohen and Paula Fraley. Copyright Like Right Now Films, LLC, 2022. For full credits, please visit MyDisabilityRoadmap.com. Thank you, everybody. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning into that. We had so much fun making it. Um, I've got like four or five questions for Samuel that he's spoken out answers to over a gradual period of time. And then we'd love to just take any questions at all about anything that you guys have. So uh, I'm going to start. Samuel, you have to hit your switch. The first question is, what are your hopes and dreams for the film? What are your hopes and dreams for the film kind of going forward as it gets out there? We're trying a new kind of system here with Samuel's got a switch near his joystick. So go ahead and give that a good push.
Go ahead, you got it. I'll give you some help on the first one. You gotta get that motor memory going. Ready? Uh, yes. My goal for the film is that people won't talk down to people with disabilities. I want everyone to know that people, people with disabilities demand respect and rights. And I want other young adults with disabilities to have the same opportunities that I have had for healthcare, inclusive education, college, assistive technology, jobs, making friends, and independent living. In September of 2021, I move into my own home, an addition on my parents' place. I want people to learn from disability role models like Judy Human and Bob Williams. I want to help people learn how to live a full life with a disability as they transition to an adult by focusing on all the possibilities of relationships, work, education, and disability rights. You want to share with folks uh, what you're up to now a little bit in life? Do another shot with your switch. That's it. I am in college at NHTI, the local community college in Concord. I am working on getting my liberal arts associate's degree. I have been taking one class a semester and have a 3.0 GPA. So far, I have taken sociology, cultural anthropology, psychology, contemporary ethical issues, U.S. history, and social media strategies. This past semester, I took mindful communications and I joined the environmental action club. I have enjoyed meeting new people. I look forward to making more friends and maybe finding a girlfriend. So Sam, well, you, uh, you spoke with some incredible mentors that we got to meet around the country. And uh, well, maybe we'll talk more about our plans for the full film that we're working on now that'll have a lot more of their voices. But were there any particular piece of advice that you felt was particularly helpful? advice I got from one of my mentors, May Soon Zaid, was, you are not alone. Find your community. That was powerful advice because I have always had a strong community, starting with Beaver Meadow Elementary School. I am continuing to find my community at NHTI Community College, in the Disability Rights Community, at work at the Westchester Institute for Human Development, and in my hometown of Concord. Um, we've had some adventures making this film, continue to have adventures. Is there any, um, any best parts of making the film that you wanna share with people? I love to travel. So my favorite part of making the film was going around the country with my dad, seeing new places, filming with my GoPros, and meeting all of these cool adults with disabilities like Keith Jones, who is a hip hop musician and human rights advocate. He is hilarious. So we've also had our fair of misadventures uh, filming. We could tell a lot of stories about travel and misadventures with all the stuff we go with. Anything particular you want to share about that? Setting up and getting all the interviews done was the most challenging part of creating the film. We had to fly or drive a long way for the interviews. On our flight to Indianapolis, they turned my power wheelchair on its side both ways and it got damaged both ways. On our trip to DC, we had a six hour flight delay. And then as we were finally boarding our plane, another passenger talked down to me like I was a three year old. I wanted to curse at her, but didn't. On our NYC trip, I had a seizure. But we still got the filming done on all the trips. You hear the beeping. It's like, is that our beeping? Is that somebody else's beeping? I think that's somebody else's beeping. All right, you got it. Love that pump. Um, Samuel, you were starting to say something during that last piece about the woman in the airport. Is there something you want to say? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, I, I, uh, 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 u
He wanted to say what the F. <laughs> that was good for the PG-13 version. <laughs> we select our audiences for the full version. <laughs> By the way, as Emily mentioned, or Stephen, I think we, we did edit just a little bit in the middle that is in the New York Times version that has a little more color of the sexuality discussion, if you want to check that out. Um, we would love to open it up to the audience now. And I think we have some questions. I know Nick had his hand up earlier. So if you want to hit him up. Hey, Sam, first uh, to both of you, thanks for, again, being brave and making a movie like this. Uh, I know it's life for all of us, but people like my mother saw the movie and she's found a new way to talk to my son because of what she saw on there and maybe knocked out some habits on it and things like that. So I thought that was cool. Um, going back to people talking down to you and uh, the one in the airport that was in the film and obviously your reaction now to that one. I don't know if they're the same or separate, but uh, beyond being pissed off, beyond being ready to scream about it, which I see in even my six-year-old son all the time, um, how do you deal with that in the long run to try and figure out some way to move past it? Because I imagine it's gotta be very difficult. You can hit your switch for that, Sam. You had something you wanted to share? I want to curse at people who talk down to me, like Joe, the woman at the airport in the film. But I did not because I'm afraid that people would get mad at me. Next time, I will say talk to me like I'm an adult. I am learning a lot from people with disabilities, that it's not easy to be an adult with a disability. But I'm learning from them how to be a better disability rights advocate. I'm learning to be a better advocate for my life and for other people with disabilities. Thanks. Who else has anything they want to ask or say? Who's uh, in the back, James? So Mira is six and um, starting to come into her own. What Samuel... Um, what have your parents done, do you think, that has been very helpful and empowering you, uh, enabling you to empower yourself? Yeah, but we haven't done anything. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say, um, what, is there anything from your earlier childhood that you think we tried to do that, that might have helped you then or now? Mm. Is there something, whoops, oh, hold on, something you want to try and say? Is there something on your device? I'm not sure. Give us just a word. Give us a word and I'll try and expand on it. Are you talking about the communication device? Oh, okay. So that's what he was pointing to. So Sam was saying getting access to a communication device and trying to help that be successful, which is, as we heard earlier, not always easy, as I'm sure many of you know. Is that what you're getting at? Okay. And I'll, I'll share one other piece of advice I got from a, one of my mentors, Bob Williams, who was in the film as well, the man who used the communication device. I got to meet Bob when we were making our first film, including Samuel. And uh, I said, give me some advice, you know, on parenting Samuel, I need some help. And he said, give him choices at every juncture. Just always give him choices. You know, what shirt are you gonna wear today? What do you wanna eat? When do you wanna do your homework? I mean, within the boundaries of parenting, right? Um, and, and what he was saying was you, you need to get him to, to, to advocate for himself and to self-determine his life. 
it's, it has to be about his life. And the only way he's going to be able to learn to do that is to have choices all the time. And given that we take away a lot of choices unnecessary, um, without really wanting to by all the doctor's appointments and blood draws and, you know, all the stuff we've gone through, unfortunately, the kids don't always have that full choice, you know, in reality to go through a lot of that. So we give them, give them choices. And Betsy, do you want to add anything to that in terms of parenting stuff? <laughs> Let me think about it. Okay. Somebody else? Hello. Um, can you guys talk about just your collaboration? I feel like I'm so impressed by the way you work together um, and I'm in all of that. So love to hear more. You got an answer for that one that you worked on, Samuel? Oops, I have them for you up here. Go ahead. We all work together on most parts of the film. I have the awesome role to do the individual interviews. I compose the questions with my voice and my dad programs them into my communication device. Although we work together as a team, each person involved with the production of this film has their strengths that we try to highlight in different ways. I have enjoyed being able to work with my dad so closely on something we are both passionate about. So what I would add a little bit to Samuel is that there, there are a lot of, this is a very, if you haven't, of course, you know, it's a very ableist society. And there are a lot of people, as we showed in the film and that you've all experienced in your life, underestimate people with disabilities all the time. So there's a lot of what I would call skeptics out there that Samuel really has the capacity and to, like all of your kids, to do well in school, to learn the curriculum, to, you know, with the right supports, hopefully graduate from high school and do whatever they want to do after that, whether that's college or work or be in relationships. So I think we've gone to great lengths to be transparent about the process, like you saw in the Bob Williams piece where he speaks it out. And it's very hard because of Samuel's GNA01, how it's progressed for him to independently use this device, but you do like you're doing today, you work really hard to hit that switch and use the device. So we try to show that as well. Um, and there was actually a great article in Forbes magazine that just came out about the film by a disabled writer, Andrew Polrang, who really gets it. And he wanted to include a five minute clip of Samuel answering one of his questions slowly, verbally, like he does, just for transparency, you know? Because there's a lot of people that'll be skeptical that Samuel really has capacity to do this. It's sad, but true. So. That's another way we're collaborating is, is really giving Samuel the chance to and the space and time to speak out these questions. And, and we and Samuel's now developed answers to like 30 different questions. And so when we get an interview request, we say, here are the 20 questions Samuel's prepared to answer. You tell us which ones you want to ask. And then they say, well, we have 10 more questions. We say, no, it's going to take 10 hours for Samuel to generate the answer. We can't we don't have that. I'll answer anything you want. I can blab on, but he needs time. So does that answer most of the question? OK. I have a couple questions for Samuel that I could follow up with, but if anybody else has a question, some people might be interested in Samuel's, you know, perspective on the communication device technology and his own, you know, what it's like to use that. Do you want to talk about the challenges, the realities of using the device for everyday life? I agree that it is really slow and frustrating to use a device, especially because it has gotten harder for me to move my arms because of my GNA01 neurodevelopmental disorder and it is really hard for me to talk. That is why we put the scene in the film where I am speaking out the words one by one, and my dad is repeating them. Then we show him programming them into the device. I think that shows that it takes a long time to get the words into my device. We also showed Bob slowly typing his words in his scene. We also wanted to show that I communicate better with people that are patient, and who talk to me in an age-appropriate way. And I know we're just about at lunchtime. We don't want to keep anybody from lunch, but I just thought it might be fun for Sam to talk about his dreams for the future, unless there are any... I mean, we'll be around at lunch in the rest of the day, and we'd love to just have informal talk conversations with people. But do you want to share a little bit about your, uh, your dreams for the future? I dream about getting married, having kids, mm -hmm. and making more films. I am thinking about transferring to a four-year college in the future and traveling around the country and the world. I want to go to the Football Hall of Fame, Mount St. Helens, 
a Florida Gators game with my cousins, London and Europe. And thankfully, Sam was getting paid for this work, so we can start buying plane tickets for himself, <laughs> which he's going to need to do. Um, so we'll wrap we'll wrap up with that. I'm going to be facilitating the inclusive education breakout later about the kind of brainstorming, and then Betsy and Sam are going to facilitate a social relationships breakout. So definitely look forward to talking with you guys over lunch and at the breakouts, and and just so good to be with you all here today. It feels amazing, amazingly good. Would, anything else, Sam? Final words? Gestures. Final gestures. <laughs> the piv the patented fist bump. All right. Thanks everybody. Enjoy lunch. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks, Dan. And thank you, Samuel. We appreciate your perspectives. I think it informs all of our uh, understanding of how we can approach this difficult topic with all of our loved ones. So we appreciate you sharing it. That brings us to lunch. So there is lunch outside. If you'd be uh, just enjoy that. We've got it slated until one o'clock and then we'll come back in here. So enjoy your lunch. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask Emily, myself or Alice. Happy to help you. Thanks.